Hello, my name is Sang Hwa Nan. I'm a senior security engineer currently working in security R&D team at Line Corporation. I'm in mainly in charge of security consulting and security development and try to help developers making their services and features more secure. In this presentation, we are going to start by introducing how we integrate security in the software development process. Then we will discuss real-world problems we faced, explain the security features we designed to solve them, and how we implemented them while ensuring cross-platform support. Lastly, we will conclude by sharing the lesson we learned along the way. Line services handle a large amount of sensitive data. Naturally, security became a key part of the business rather than a simple policy. The traditional way to mitigate security threat in the software development life cycle is to do security review at the final stage. Because this, is, this life cycle is mostly focused on development, there is less focus on security than on the other stages. By the time security engineers perform security checks, the products would have passed through most of the other stage and been almost fully developed. So discovering a security threat at such a late stage means redesigning and rewriting a lot of code, which wastes a lot of time. Therefore, we are trying to incorporate security into all stages of the software development life cycle. This is called the secure software development life cycle. The obvious advantage is that we can identify issues sooner and work on resolving them immediately. So it's a great practice, but it does come with its complication. A common challenge is, is that it can temporarily disrupt existing pro development workflow. In order to efficiently integrate security into the development pipeline, without disrupting the existing development process. It is better not only to provide security guidelines, but to develop and provide security, guide, uh, security module features, features themselves instead of letting developers making their own implementation. That's why we develop those features inside the security module. I will talk about the security challenges that we have encountered while implementing security features for our banking services. We launched the first mobile banking services in Thailand, and we are going to expand banking services into other countries, including Japan, Taiwan, and Indonesia. Our mobile banking services will enable users to make deposit and get a loan through their smartphone, and naturally, it will be connected to the LINE application. In order to ensure a fluid and user-friendly experience across the plat LINE platform, the problem is that those banking services must work in both LINE channel web application and standalone application. The advantage of hybrid application are that you can just build a single application for all available platform. However, hybrid application security is more complex and it's, it is hard to guarantee good enough security for financial services. Let's talk briefly about the threat of cross-site script vulnerabilities. It is one of the most common type of vulnerability found in web application, and it allows an attacker to execute malicious code in the application context. An attacker exploiting a cross-site script vulnerability can gain the ability, ability to do whatever the user can, user can do, including copying its password, making payment, accessing financial information, and much more. Also, JavaScript has one defining flow, flow in terms of security. This is because JavaScript is an interpreted language. So instead of being compiled to machine code, and 
JavaScript code compiled and execute, executed at runtime. In addition, as opposed to native mobile code, JavaScript is not signed. This means attacker can easily analyze, analyze and modify hybrid application code. Therefore, core security features should be implemented in native, not JavaScript. For that, we need to implement a bridge so that hybrid application can use those security features from the JavaScript side. One of the thread model we have is that the authentication token can be hijacked and transaction data can be maliciously modified on the JavaScript side. To mitigate those threats, the traditional way is to add a second factor of authentication with, for example, one-time passcode hardware security token. That way, even if the attacker has the authentication token, they will not be able to bypass the additional authentication factor. However, this second factor creates friction for the user experience. So we decided to make our own extra authentication layer to authorize user, user interaction. First, let's talk about device binding. It relies on an online identity verification technology called EKYC. When the user successfully completes the EKYC process, a device binding key is generated on the device. And the server only trusts transaction signed with this key. In addition to device binding signature for transaction or access to private information, we require additional biometric authentication by the user. Let's now talk about the specific case of transaction confirmation. When a user attempts to initiate a transaction as a as a security measure to prevent transaction information to be tampered on the JavaScript side. It requires a visual confirmation by the user of the transaction information through a native UI. The confirmation is obtained by a biometric authentication method. With this, with this authentication method, user can be protected even if the attacker attempt to intercept and modify user operation on the JavaScript side. Now, I would like to explain the device binding mechanism in more detail and the challenges that we have encountered while implementing that, that features across platforms. The device binding is based on public key cryptography and a challenging response authentication of the device. Every time the client needs to make an important request, the client first gets from the server a random number called a uh, challenge. Then it replies with the request body and the random challenge, both signed with the device binding private key. Finally, to authenticate the request, the server verifies the challenge value and checks the signature using the device binding public key. The trust model relies on registering this public key during the EKYC process. In addition, the private key should be protected by some secure hardware to make its extraction impossible. Such secure hardware could be a trusted execution environment or a secure element. This way, the device used during the KYC process is permanently linked with the user's account on the server. Of course, it is important for the server to verify that device binding key is indeed protected by secure hardware. For that, we performed what is called a key attestation. The secure hardware generates a certificate attesting the key was generated inside the secure hardware. The key technology of this authentication method is trusted execution environment. I'd like to explain exactly what TER and how TE can be used when developing security features in mobile application. 
T are on hardware-based isolation technology, allowing signed code to run in you know, a separate CPU context and memory alongside uh, the main operating system. Neither normal processes or the main operating system cannot access the data or code in the TE. This isolated execution environment can be trusted for sensitive operation, such as user authentication and cryptographic key management. ARM, impl ARM implementation of the TE concept is known as the ARM trust zone. Nowadays, every smartphone running Android supports the ARM trust zone to some level and runs a trusted operating system. iOS devices go beyond a simply trusted execution environment by having a dedicated crypto processor called the Secure Enclave. It is possible for application developers to make their own trusted application running on the trusted operating system inside the trust zone. But this requires access to a SDK and a code signing certificate for the trusted operating system. The practical problem we have encountered while developing trusted application is that custom T development on Android is nearly a per manufacturer problem. This is because every major manufacturer have their own trusted operating system with their own SDK and require their own signing certificate. We investigated how many of our user devices we could support using a commercial T development solution but it represented only about 20% of our Android, use, Android users. In the case of iOS, we cannot do any trusted application development because Apple doesn't give, it, give to access to their secure enclave. Another problem is that a code signing and provisioning infrastructure is required to deploy a custom trusted application. This infrastructure needs HSM servers and load balancer, which is expensive for small scale deployment. While great on paper, in practice, these technologies are unfortunately very difficult to be used by application developers, even at line scale. As an alternative to custom T trusted application development, we can use the features natively supported by each platform trusted operating system. Hardware key management features are exposed under Android via the key store APIs and under iOS via the keychain APIs. The problem is that the Android key store and iOS keychain features are, are mismatched. Mainly, iOS doesn't support key importation and key authentication was not supported before iOS 14. The other problem is that all Android key store operations are not guaranteed to happen inside the TE. There is some minimal requirement, but depending on the device. Some features are implemented outside of TE. For example, the T key authentication is not required to happen inside the TE on older devices. An attacker can find authentication private key through reverse engineering. Mismatched or unsupported security features across de devices make it hard to provide a uniform level of security for every device. And we need, when we need to match the, the features provided by both iOS and Android into one coherent security architecture. I would like to introduce white box cryptography as a practical solution for making one coherent security architecture across platforms and improve the security of local key management. 
White box cryptography aims to protect cryptographic primitives and keys in software implementation. Even when the adversary has a full control of the execution environment and complete access to the implementation of the cryptographic algorithm. Cryptographic keys are embedded in the algorithm, making it inherently difficult to extract them. Moreover, the keys are never revealed in plain text form in memory, even during execution of the cryptographic algorithm. With such, secure tech with such technology, it becomes extremely, extremely difficult for attackers to locate, modify, and extract the cryptographic keys. White box cryptography offers increased resistance to reverse engineering and dynamic code instrumentation toolkit like Brita Exposure. Because the encryption key is bound to the device, even if an attacker takes the key object itself, they cannot use it in another device. White box cryptography is purely software-based, so we can use it to develop custom cryptographic APIs and fallback functionalities for any platform. However, since white box implementations are a kind of obfuscation, the performance is slower than non-white box implementation, but it is still faster than a call to the TV or secure element. Of course, it could be implemented by improved by implementing key caching feature, parallel implementation, and supporting multi-thread encryption. Key attestation is a very practical use case for white box which can be used to provide a fallback implementation for devices that don't support the TE-based key attestation. Another use case is to help with key provisioning instead of using hard-coded static key, which can be discovered by reverse engineering the application. Those keys can be protected with a white box. In addition to static key provisioning, white box can also be used to protect dynamic key provisioned from the server side. So far, we talked about how we could use white box to make one coherent security architecture across platforms and to improve the security of the local crypto system. That's all from my side. From now on, my fellow engineer Charles is going to explain biometric authentication on mobile. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I talk about our efforts to integrate biometric authentication inside of line products. This is an interesting case of why mobile security is harder in reality than on paper. Historically, people have been using passwords for authentication. This is a knowledge factor of authentication, something you know. The problem is everybody hates passwords. Users hate passwords because they hate creating them, remembering them, and typing them, especially on mobile with an awkward virtual keyboard. Product managers also hate passwords because they have to enforce rules to avoid weak passwords, and this creates user experience frictions. Even security engineers hate passwords because we have to manage password transmission and storage in a secure way, and also have to deal with password brute force attempts. In the end, we have frustrated users who choose to use Password Manager to simplify their life. Product managers are also frustrated and start asking if they can reduce the number of times a user has to authenticate. That's how options such as Remember Me or Automatic Login starts to appear. The problem is that we are not actually authenticating the user, but the device instead. Security engineers like us are also frustrated, and so we do what we do best, which is researching and designing new authentication methods and protocols, such as password authenticated key exchange, second factor authentication, or biometric authentication. In this presentation, I will talk about biometric authentication, which is an inherent factor of authentication, something you are. The most common types of biometric include fingerprint, 
irises or faces to cite a few. In the last few years, biometrics has gained a lot of popularity on mobile devices. All actively supported iOS devices have either Touch ID or Face ID, and biometric authentication has been a part of Android compatibility definition documents since Android 6.0, released five years ago. It is a very user-friendly technology, and it's the most popular way of unlocking a smartphone nowadays. The question is, how can we leverage biometric to implement authentication securely? There is a simple but bad way to implement biometric authentication, which is to dissociate the local biometric authentication by the user from the remote authentication with the server. First of all, we assume the user has already registered a biometric template inside the TE or SE, which is in charge of biometric matching. It is important to mention this template never leaves the TE or SE and cannot be accessed by anyone. In the setup phase, after the initial account creation or recovery using another authentication factor, a secret authentication token is shared between the server-side service and the client-side application. In the authentication phase, when the application requires user authentication, it proceeds first with a biometric authentication of the user by the TESE. This is shown in step 1, 2, and 3. And then, if the biometric authentication is successful, then the local application will authenticate with the remote services using its secret token in step 4. This method, however, only solves the UX aspect of the problem, and many, many security issues are left unresolved. First of all, the TE or SE doesn't know what it is authenticating, actually, and the application only receives back a success code. This means it can be easily bypassed in software. Secondly, the secret authentication token has to be transmitted over the network and has to be stored both on the client side and on the server side. This opens many opportunities for an attacker to snatch the token and clone the authentication session, again bypassing the biometric authentication. The better way of doing it is to rely on the hardware security feature offered by the TE or SE. Now in the setup phase, uh, in addition to the template, uh, there is an asymmetric signing key pair which is generated inside the TE or SE in step one and two. And only the public key uh, part of the key pair is shared with the service in step three. Also, the TE and SE is configured in a specific way to only unlock the private key and its usage when the user successfully authenticates using biometrics. This means that extracting the private key or using it without a successful biometric authentication is, in principle, impossible and should be guaranteed by the TE or SE. The authentication phase rely on a challenge response protocol built using this asymmetric key pair in a similar fashion to what was described earlier by my colleague. The server will send a random challenge to the application in step one. Then the application will ask the TE or SE to sign it using the private key in step two. When the TE or SE receive that request, it will in turn require the user to perform a biometric authentication in step three. And if the authentication is successful, it will return the signed challenge in step four. Finally, the signed challenge will be sent to the server for authentication and the server can verify the signature using the public key that was shared during the setup phase. What is important here is that all the sensitive data are isolated inside the TE or SE, so they cannot be extracted, and the signature cannot be performed without user interaction. This means we are protected from most local threats. On the remote service, only the public key has to be stored, and the network only carries a random challenge and its signature. All of those information are not sensitive, which means the security parameter has been reduced to a single component, which is the TE or SE. Now, none of this is new, and there is a standard for that. In security, you should stick to standard whenever possible. This is because standards are reviewed by many experts, and so there is less chance for a flow to have slipped through. 
Fast Identity Online, more well known as FIDO, is a set of standards aiming to replace passwords with other factors of authentication. It of course covers biometric authentication, but other authentication factors as well. These standards are maintained by the FIDO Alliance, and member includes some of the biggest tech companies, such as Microsoft, Google, Apple, but also Line. Among those standards, FIDO2 makes the most sense for us, because it covers both first and second factor of authentication, but also has been standardized for the web as WebAuthn by the W3C. Since Line, in addition to its native applications, also has many web-based services, this means we could use the same authentication protocol and infrastructure both for web services and native applications. Now, having a standard doesn't mean it's supported everywhere. On the web, FIDO2 has gained widespread support in browsers thanks to the WebAuthn standard. So it can now be used on all the most recent versions of the most popular browser on both desktop and mobile. And I wrote down a few. However, the native support is way more limited. Notably, iOS and macOS currently don't support FIDO2 for native applications. Technically, we could use a web view inside the native application and rely on WebAuthnt, but this is not very practical and limited to iOS 14. Android native FIDO2 support is also problematic for some of our use cases. The, the implementation allows any mix of biometric authentication, device screen lock like pin or pattern, and even external security keys. However, it doesn't let the developer select which one can be used in their application and doesn't even indicate which one was used by the user. This is a problem because uh, this might not fit a po company internal policy or the external regulation it has to abide. And this is especially a concern for financial applications. The only way to solve the issue is, I just mentioned, is to basically make our own FIDO2 platform authenticator. Uh, and this is what we did. Since we have to support both Android and iOS, we decided to share as much code as possible between those platforms. For that, we first built an abstraction layer over each platform's specific biometric and key management APIs. Then, on top of that platform abstraction layer, we implemented the FIDO2 logic in C++, so that we could share it between Android and iOS. Since the FIDO2 logic is shared, there is a perfect match between our Android and iOS authenticator in terms of feature and behavior. They both support the same type of credentials, the same cryptographic algorithms, and the same attestation format. In addition, we can easily implement our own FIDO2 protocol extension on both platforms. For our implementation, we first need to build an abstraction layer. So I'll first talk about the iOS side of things. iOS key management API are straightforward. The most important ones are SecKey generate pair, SecKey copy public key, and SecKey create signature. And in addition to that, by passing access control attributes to SecKey generate pair, we can configure the key protection mechanism. These attributes are created using the sec access control create with flags function. Those flags allow to define the security policy and requirements to use the private key. This is how we can require the SE to only sign data if the user authenticates with biometrics. If a key is configured to require biometric authentication, calling sec key create signature automatically triggers the face ID or touch ID authentication dialog. Developers do not have to worry about handling the UI themselves. But if needed, the prompt displayed on the dialog can be customized. Android is slightly more tricky because the key management APIs and biometric authentication APIs are separated. On Android, keys, even when protected by the TEE, are managed inside a Java key store. Asymmetric key pair can be generated using a key pair generator object and are configured using keygen parameter spec object. This last object is used to specify the cryptographic primitive, parameters, and key access control. This is how you can require user verification to use the private key. 
Protection by the TE, however, cannot be required during the generation. It can only be checked after the fact by querying the key info object. Depending on the device, TE protection might not be available at all. To perform a signature, the init sign method of the private key is used. It returns a signature object, which, if user verification is required, need to be first unlocked by a user authentication API. The problem is that Android has many different authentication APIs depending on the version and type of biometrics. The first one of those is the KeyGuard Manager, which was introduced in API level 21, and is performing authentication using the device screen lock, so a pin or a pattern. Later, the Fingerprint Manager was introduced in API level 23 to support fingerprint auth authentication specifically. However, the name is not really fit, so when other types of biometrics started to appear, Google created a third API called the Biometric Prompt in API level 28, which supports any kind of biometric. And then from API level 29, the Biometric Prompt can also be used to support a device screen lock based authentication. The problem is all of those APIs have a different design, and this creates an API fragmentation, which is problematic for developers. That's why Google made a compatibility layer called Android X.Biometric, which merged the fingerprint manager and the biometric prompt into one single interface. And for your peace of mind, I would highly recommend using it. There are, however, additional problems with biometric authentication on Android. First of all, Integration of the biometric sensor with an authentication API has to be done by the device manufacturer themselves. This means that support may vary depending on the device and the Android version. Secondly, not all biometric sensors are made equal. On Android, they are divided into weak and strong, depending on the level of security they provide. For example, image-based face recognition is considered a weak form of biometric while 3D scan-based face recognition is considered a strong form of biometrics. The problem is that a weak biometric is allowed to authenticate the user, but not to protect a private key. Only a strong one can. These issues can be confusing for users, because biometric authentication support will vary from case to case. Unfortunately, this is not explained to them, so they might instead blame the application developers for the lack of support. This means we have to take on the burden of explaining those details to users. Now, apart from uh, this uh, biometric API, there is one last problem we, have to, we had to solve, which involves key attestation. And it was explained earlier by my colleagues. So we want some key attestation mechanism to ensure the key has been generated by a legitimate client inside the TE or SE. This is important also to protect against man-in-the-middle attack during client registration. But again, due to the lack of good native support for attestation APIs, we decided to implement our own attestation based on a white box cryptography implementation. For more details on how Line is using biometric authentication, you can watch the following talks uh, by our colleagues, which I listed on this slide. Uh, if you miss them, the recordings will be available later. Now, I would like to conclude with a few lessons we've learned with this type of projects over the years. First of all, let's talk about legacy. Uh, this is not something you security engineers usually think about. Supporting legacy device is the most important factor to select a security feature, and it will shape the whole security design. If your feature is about device trust, then it has to be supported everywhere, or else one exception will ruin everything. If your feature is about device security, how do you justify the security of the unsupported device? And if the security level is sufficient without the feature, then how do you justify the time and cost of implementing this feature? Also. New security features and API in new OS release are really nice, but as I just explained, we cannot start using them immediately. We can only start using them a few years down the line, once they have reached a larger market share. 
Lastly, Android fragmentation is often mentioned in relation with OS versions. But actually, hardware fragmentation is also an important issue. Even if they are updated, older devices will not offer the same feature as newer ones. Our second lesson is about cross-platform matching, cross-platform. Because matching features on multiple platforms can be challenging if you can only rely on native API, APIs. Re-implementing features might be sometimes required. And if you are re-implementing re something, it's easier to aim for one common implementation. This way, you'll have a perfect match of features across your platforms. And also, you'll have less bugs to fix, as debugging on one platform can translate into solving other platform problems. So cross-platform development can seem a daunting task, but it can actually be made easy with a smart code architecture. What we recommend is building a platform abstraction layer because that has allowed us to share the core logic and save us time. Our next lesson is about using TEEs. We tried TE custom development, but while very flexible, we found it was not a realistic solution for application developers. The licenses are very expensive, and so is the, the, the infrastructure required for the development. Also, the device support, as what we saw, is that the device support was very limited. So you need to think about the fallback option. And then the question is, why not just use the fallback option? So since we were not able to make our own custom trusted application, we tried really hard to rely on each platform, native TE and SE APIs. But I hope this talk showed you that uh, this is not easy because the features are not uniform across platforms. Our last lesson is regarding security development. Developers do understand security basics, but they are unfamiliar with more advanced things such as thread models, security design patterns, and standards. And since it's not their job, they're also not keeping up with the latest researches and standards. Developer priority is the release schedule, not security, which means they often choose simplicity over security. But in practice, it's important to respect both. That's why there needs to be a mutual understanding between developers and security engineers, so that the best compromises can be found. Our experience is that doing some development inside the security department can be more efficient. Because while we are less efficient at development tasks, this is compensated by our security experience. It also significantly simplified the security review process for us. So thank you very much for listening to our talk today. Uh, I want to point out that all of this work was, of course, not the result of just our efforts alone, but was made possible thanks to the collaboration of our wonderful colleagues at Line, Line Plus, and Line Financial Plus.